Hello, good evening, students. Uh, welcome to the Law of Thoughts class. So I believe that you're going to enjoy today's lecture because Law of Thoughts is a very interesting subject. And uh, I hope you enjoy this journey with me. And um, being law students, Law of Thoughts, again, is a very, very essential subject. In fact, it comprises of a big chunk or a huge chunk of civil law. Now, without wasting much time, we'll directly just go into the subject. So the first question that will come to our mind is, what is tort? Uh, I mean, the term looks a little bit, you know, different because the spelling also is like simple, but yet it looks a little bit like a, a, a term which can elicit a lot of questions in our mind, tort, T-O-R-T. -T. So what is this tort? And what is this law of tort? Um, I hope I'm audible to you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thanks. Thanks for confirming. Okay, so today uh, we'll talk about the law of tort and we'll see what it is. Now, tort, T-O-R-T, -T, means a civil wrong. Just to set the perspective, I'll give you a brief introduction of what the law of tort really is. Okay, tort means a civil wrong. Now, of course, it is different from, you know, you must have heard of contracts. It is different from contracts. It is a law which basically deals when uh, deals with wrongs that are inflicted upon a person by another person knowingly or unknowingly. It can be due to negligence. It can be deliberate, that is on purpose. However, the key factor to be seen in thought, which is a civil wrong is, one, that the wrong is committed, just to put in simple terms, you know, that the wrong is committed, the other party is hurt, Third, that the person who does the wrong is expected to take care that he or she should not do this wrong. Just in simple words. Okay, that's the third thing. And the fourth thing is the person who is harmed because he or she is harmed now gets the right to claim remedy or to knock the doors of the court because of that wrong. Now, let me give you a very simple example. Now, A is the owner of a property, a huge land. A is owner of a big plot of land. And uh, B is just a passerby. B is just walking at the side of the land. He is in a hurry. He sees time is passing and he needs to get to point X. So to get to point X, the fastest route for B is to cut through the land of Mr. A. But if he goes the normal route, he would reach there in 15 minutes. But if he cuts through the land of A, he would just be there in five minutes. So B decides, well, why should I take the trouble of going through the long route, let me just take a short route and let me go via A's land. Now, do you know that when we cut through people's property, it amounts to trespass? That means we are not supposed to walk through somebody else's property. Even if it is an open property, it is there is no defense that the property is not, you know, it is not confined or it is not having any boundary walls or it is not having any boundary at all. The property is open. So I was under the presumption that I could walk through this place. So that is not a defense. Are you understanding me? So trespass in law sometimes can be a civil wrong. Sometimes depending upon the facts and circumstances of the case, it can be as a criminal offense. 
Now, there are certain terms that I want you to understand. In civil wrong, uh, in civ I'm sorry, in civil law, when a wrong is committed, it is a wrong. When a wrong is committed, it is a wrong. And when an act or omission is committed to the detriment of the other party, or so to say to harm the other party, it is a wrong. It is considered as a wrong. So this wrong can be private wrong or public wrong. When the wrongs are considered to be public in nature, that is, it affects the community at large and it trespasses the ken of public law, that means it is a public wrong. For example, criminal laws. Are you understanding me? Ne next is a private wrong sometimes or all the time can come within the ambit of wrong, or oh, sorry, tort. Now, in tort, when the act or omission becomes a tort, it is a wrong, or it is wrong in the eyes of the law, it is a wrong, it is a civil wrong, but in criminal law, we call it as an offense, a crime. So when an act or omission is against the law, whether it takes away the right of the party or a person does not commit a particular duty, which amounts to uh, you know, inflicting some injury to the other party, whether it is physical or mental. So that becomes a criminal act, however, or a criminal offense or a crime. However, in thought, we do not call it as an offense or a crime, we call it as a wrong. So I'm reiterating again, in simple words, what is tort? Tort is nothing but a civil wrong. The question is asked to you, what is tort? So your answer should be, tort means a civil wrong. We will go through our slides, you will understand then, in more depth you will understand, but just to set the perspective, so tort is mostly a private wrong. It sometimes may be a public wrong, but mostly it's private wrong. A tort is normally a suit for tort or a case under the law of torts is filed in the civil courts. A tort is something which does not come under the ambit of the definition of contractual laws nor does it come under breach of trust. For breach of trust and for contracts, we have a distinct law that is a law of contracts. A breach of trust, I mean, it's just a principle and you know it depends upon what kind of law it is, whether it's law of contract or whether there's law of trust, it depends what is that breach of trust. So when it is not a breach of trust and it is not contract when a wrong is committed it comes within the ambit of tort okay what are the examples of tort one is committing a wrong due to negligence what is negligence negligence means what is negligence can you answer me what do you understand by negligence? Yeah, I, mean, I can answer. It's an act committed with carelessly. Careless. Perfect. Carelessly. Yeah. So a yeah. negligent act or omission, whatever it is, negligence means when something is done carelessly. Now, why do you think that the law is trying to you know, frame a person within its presence in a way that if a person is negligent, why do you think that if a person is careless, the law takes hold of you? Take, I mean, grips. Why do you think so? The reason is, in a civilized society, all of us are expected 
to be prudent in thinking, to be wise, to be prudent, and to have reasonable thought. And any person of normal and reasonable prudence would not inflict a harm or an injury on another person by being careless. So therefore, the law says, as a normal human being, every person is expected to be careful. A person is expected to exercise due diligence, care, caution, and to be prudent. You're expected to walk carefully, to talk carefully, to drive carefully. Are you understanding me? We cannot walk in the way however we want. Suppose if you decide, if a person decides that, okay, I'll just walk because it's my life, I will do whatever I want, it doesn't work like that. The law says, if there is any harm or injury caused to another person because of your negligent act, that means you will be held responsible for the loss or the injury that may be caused to the other person because of your negligence. Suppose if I'm in a hurry and I'm just running and I dash somebody and I just throw the person down and say the person is badly injured because he fell in the wrong way. I had no intention of harming the person. It's just that I wasn't careful. But say the person, there is really serious injury and then the person's family decides to, uh, you know, to file a suit against me in the court of law and claim compensation. So do you think the person is going to win the case? So the answer to that is yes, obviously, because I have been negligent, I've not been careful, and because of my imprudent behavior or imprudent uh, way of walking, where I've not exercised due care, diligence, caution in my walk, in, in, in the way I walk, so I've caused an injury to someone, so of course the court will ask me to pay compensation for the harm that is caused to the other person. So surely you know that accident is wrong. Now listen carefully. Neglect, there are some thoughts, T-O-R-T, -T, there are some thoughts which have a tinge or a hue or a color of criminal law. Sometimes in the course of study, you may realize that certain grounds also come within the ambit of criminal laws. For example, negligent driving negligent driving, driving in a reckless manner and causing harm to person and property. It is a criminal offense in most part of the world. And of course it is, you get a ticket or a chalan, whatever you call it in your country. You get a ticket from the police or you get a chalan. You understanding me? So it's a criminal law, it's a police case. As well as, God forbid if, there is some wrong inflicted to a person in a way that it is the person decides to claim compensation for you know the 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 expenses that he or she has incurred uh, you know for getting themselves treated them uh, themselves if it is a group of people or himself or herself it is a particular individual to be treated in an, in a hospital. So it is a huge bill. So the person can claim it from the driver who has been driving recklessly and has been negligent. If the case is proved that the, the driver has been at fault or the driver has been negligent and has displayed reckless driving due to which the accident uh, was caused or the, because of which there was an accident and the person has, you know, uh, you know has contracted injuries of whatever nature. So this is something that you're going to learn in the law of thoughts. It's very interesting. We'll have a lot of case case studies. We'll have a lot of uh, you know real cases that we are going to study about. It's really interesting. Uh, maybe in the course of our lectures, we are also, if we have time, the problem is the subject is vast, but we are having a very short time to complete the syllabus. So I wouldn't run with the syllabus, but let's see how it goes but i desire that probably i will even share some videos or maybe if i'm not able to you know run the videos during the class hour i will send you the videos so that you may just enjoy it at home because in that way there are certain videos which are interesting which are actually case videos and that will really help you to really grasp the subject more easily
So without wasting time, we'll go further now and we will check our slides. So for this class, we'll just deal with just the introduction part of it, just the general principles, and then slowly we'll start delving into the subject, uh, you know, as we move further with our other lecture. Now, what is taught? I already explained it to you. It should just be in your mind. You should never ever forget this throughout your life because now you're a law student and any law student even in his sleep is able to answer what is taught. Taught means a civil drum. When a question comes to you, I'm reiterating, that means repeating. Taught means a civil drum. And this word is actually originated from a Latin word taught. It. Just uh, mute your mic, uh, your mic please. Abdikadir. Okay, thank you. So taught means a civil drum and it has originated from the Latin word tortum, which means twisted or rung. Rung means twisted or crooked. So it pertains basically to a wrong or an injury inflicted on a person or an act which is crooked, which is not aligned with the law and is wrong. Now, the person who commits the tort or the person who commits this particular civil wrong that is a tort is called a tort feaser or a wrongdoer. But in criminal law, just for your knowledge, we call the person as criminal or offender. But in the law of torts, the person who commits a tort, which is a civil wrong, we call the person as a tort feaser or a wrongdoer. Now, this is not in your slide, but just for your knowledge. The person who files a case in the law of tort is called as the plaintiff. Now, who files a case? Of course, the person who is, you know, injured or to whom the harm is inflicted. That means he is called the aggrieved party. So the aggrieved party is the one who will file the case. So the one who files the case is called as the plaintiff. And against whom it is filed, he's called the defendant. So for that matter, who is a defendant in the case of tort? It's a tort feaser. Who has committed the, the, the wrong is a tort feaser. So the defendant party in a case will be always a tort feaser. And the plaintiff, the one who files the case, is normally the aggrieved party on whom the injury or the wrong is inflicted. As I said earlier, wrongs may be public wrong or a private wrong. Public wrongs are acts that violate public rights or are in contravention of public duty, which affects the entire community. Example, criminal offense and private wrongs are wrongs that trespass private rights or rights of an individual or group of individuals or even a corporate. So tort can also be called as a private wrong which infringes on the legal right of an individual or a specific group of people. If you have any questions, you can ask me. Now, simply put, now the law of tort basically deals with injuries or wrongs inflicted on a person which are civil in nature and does not come within the ambit. Ambit means the purview or the boundary, which does not come within the ambit or which does not come within the purview of breach of contract or breach of trust and that which can be tried in the civil courts. So for a, for a case of thought, you do not file it in the court of prosecution or in fact, it's not a criminal case. So it is a civil wrong so it should be tried in a civil court. So when an injury is inflicted, the aggrieved party, who is the aggrieved party? The one against whom the wrong is committed. Who is oh. with 
joined in the, in the matter. So when an injury is inflicted, the aggrieved party is entitled to file a suit in the court of appropriate jurisdiction. That means the right court in a, in a right area, in a right jurisdiction. That's, that means the right court in the right area and seek a remedy in the court of law. Now this remedy, that is, what are you asking the court to give you? That is, you are seeking a remedy. The aggrieved party seeks a remedy against the tort fees. Are you understanding me? The aggrieved party, that is the one who is harmed, seeks a remedy in the court of law against the tort fees. Now, what is this remedy? Remedy that may be given under the law of tort mostly is in the form of unliquidated damages. What is unliquidated damages? Now, Damages in the law of tort means the compensation that is awarded by the court as a remedy to the aggrieved party. And this, this damages is, you know, maybe in the, it may be monetary damages or it can be in the form of money. And this amount of compensation is collected from the tort feeser and the tort feeder feeser is asked to pay these damages to the to whom to whom he has to pay to the plaintiff the one who files the case or the aggrieved party the aggrieved party here is a plaintiff plaintiff is the one who files the case are you understanding me now why do you we call this as unliquidated we call it as unliquidated damages because the damages that are actually calculated by the court and it is not in the understanding of both the parties that I mean the parties uh, they do not agree to each other beforehand that this is the amount that you have to pay to me so that's the reason we call it as unliquidated damages and because liquidated damages see the opposite of unliquidated is liquidated so liquidated damages is normally a concept which is normally applied in the contract laws or the or the law of contracts so that is normally just only for your information, liquidated damages are damages which are actually decided by the parties in case of any contractual breach. But unliquidated damages are damages that are uh, normally decided and calculated by the court because they are not really ascertained by the parties who are involved in a case. So that is what we mean by unliquidated damages. So in the law of torts, the remedy that may be sought from the court is mostly in the form of unliquidated damages or some equitable relief. What is equitable relief? The equitable relief can be in the form of injunction. Like for example, what is injunction? The base, basically what do we mean by injunction is to ask a person to refrain from continuing, refrain and stop doing a particular wrong, refrain from continuing to commit the wrong. So these so normally, that's why we say that remedy that is asked in the court of law, in the law of torts, the remedy that a person can ask is in the form of unliquidated damages or compensation that can be claimed, or it can be formed in the equitable relief. Now, equitable relief example is injunction. Now, what is injunction? Let me give an example. Say now, one minute, there's something trying to enter. Okay. Say now you have... Um, a noisy neighbor. You have a noisy neighbor and uh, the neighbor is trying to, you're having an independent structure, you're living in an independent house and uh, beside your house you have a noisy neighbor and the noisy neighbor is trying to build an additional floor in his house. So naturally, so when there is, he's trying to build another floor so he will bring all those, um, you know, laborers at work. He'll get all the equipments that is required. He'll get all the stuff that is required for building the additional floor. Now, what he does is, knowingly or unknowingly, while he's constructing, he touches the roof of your house. So when he's constructing the top floor, he's trying to, uh, make an extension or a shaja that we call it the, the extension which is there it is touching the almost the roof of your house it's almost touching so naturally if it's touching the roof of your house you will not be quiet you will say come on this is my property how come you're touching the roof of my house you stay within your boundary then he might have a, a a so-called human defense, which is not allowed in law, he might say, well, I'm just going through the air where I'm touching, walking through your property. 
but then you will say no of course it's almost coming into the portion near my inside my house inside my my compound so please stop doing that and he doesn't listen to you so what is your i mean uh, what is the remedy that you have the remedy that a person can have is file a suit for injunction in simple terms sometimes you call it as a stay order you file a suit for injunction asking the party to stop your construction to further order of the court so that is called injunction a stay order so that is in the form of equitable relief why we call it as an equitable relief because it is based on the principles of equity equality equity equitable relief it's based on the principles of justice equity and good conscience so that's why we call it as an equitable relief so unliquidated damages mostly in the form of compensation equitable relief is normally in the form of injunction or uh, you know any other form of uh, remedy that may be given now here in the slide as we have said unliquidated damages means those damages that are not asserted by the parties but calculated fixed and awarded by the court to the equity party and damages here means of course compensation for the loss incurred or the injury that is inflicted so therefore we can say that the law of tort addresses and provides remedies even for non contractual civil wrongs or rather we can say it does provide remedy for non contractual civil wrongs that means if the civil wrong is not a part of a contract because contracts have their own terms and conditions and in case there is breach there is a different remedy for that under the law of contracts so therefore law of tort is a you know a uh, entirely you know different law uh, that is uh, it is a part of civil law which deals completely just with civil wrongs that are inflicted on a person those wrongs which are not contractual civil wrongs again the most common example the most 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 common example of tort is negligence harm inflicted by a person or corporate to a person or property of another due to negligence or being unmindful is a wrong and it entitles the aggrieved party to claim a remedy before the court and here the aggrieved party suffers harm because of another party's failure to exercise due care and caution now while tort wrongs are civil in nature it may have a tinge or a hue of an act being considered as an offense as i said earlier under the criminal law however similar or dissimilar terms may be attributed in the sense however you want to call it like for example another example i'll give you i'll give you the example of negligent driving i took uh, i mean i took, uh, just before we move further so just in case this class i mean uh, you know the, there's some disruption in this class please join back again okay please join back again because the class will continue for one hour so so the example that i had given you earlier was negligent driving i'm sure you understood that get another example of a tort which has a hue of a criminal offense would be defamation now defamation is in some countries a civil wrong exclusively it comes under the law of torts and defamation in some countries it, like india for example it comes under civil wrong as well as a criminal wrong a person can file a criminal case as well as a person can file a criminal case in case of defamation now what is defamation defamation is something which may be slander or libel what is slander or libel slander is something where a person talks ill about another person talks bad about another person and accuses him or her of something which he or she has not really done and it should not amount to insulting a person uh, to the extent that it harms the reputation of the person so what is important in in uh, in defamation is it harms the reputation of another person and a person has spoken ill of some other person in the form of slander so slander uh, in some countries or uh, you know is it comes of course under defamation so defamation is a tort as well as a criminal offense some countries don't regard um, tort as uh, sorry uh, does not reg uh, regard uh, defamation as uh, a, you know a, a criminal offense like for example if you take even australia australia some parts of australia consider defamation as a 
crime, a criminal offence, as well as a tort. While some parts of Australia, some other posh parts, some states in Australia say that not really, like, I mean, defamation, it is enough that it is a, a tort. And in case of defamation, the aggrieved party can claim um, damages. You can just claim compensation for the harm that is inflicted or for injury to the reputation of another person. So this is an example for you that some of the torts might have a, a slight color or a hue or a tinge of uh, you know, criminal law. However, the terms may be similar or dissimilar terms may be attributed to it. Example is negligent driving. And uh, again, I give an example of defamation and so on. Now, other examples of tort are nuisance. What is nuisance? Nuisance is something that you know, disturbs you. It's a nuisance, causing disturbance. So nuisance can be public nuisance, nuisance can be private nuisance. Um, I'll share some case laws, case law videos on this. You can watch that for nuisance. And um, now, for example, Everybody knows that at, you know, beyond 12 a.m. midnight, you're not supposed to, you know, it depends if there is a law in a particular area, some people, some places it may be 10 p.m., some places it may be 11 p.m., some places it may be 12 p.m., sorry, 12 a.m. And uh, past midnight, you're not supposed to play loud music, you're not supposed to disturb your neighbor, you're not supposed to make any noise because the world is at sleep. So suppose you have a noisy neighbor and he or and, and the neighbor starts playing loud music at 1 a.m. So that's a nuisance. So you consider it as a nuisance. So this is an example of thought. So a person, if the person doesn't listen, so you can file a, you know, again, here sometimes nuisance may be a thought, sometimes depending upon the facts and circumstances of the case, one can even file a police complaint. Same with the defamation. Again, assault. Assault also has got the hue of both. It can be a criminal assault. It can be, you know, just a civil assault. Where a person, if a person is assaulted, he might claim damages saying that you have tarnished my reputation and you should not have laid hands on me. So assault. What is battery? I know battery has different meanings, but battery in the law of tort is if a person just pushes you, for example, a person is angry on you or you are angry on somebody and you just go and just, you just, push a person's shoulder, just even you lay a finger on the person in anger and say, just push a person and say, excuse me, and you push a person. So that person, if he's annoyed, he can, you know, file a case for battery. Then malicious prosecution or malicious imprisonment or false imprisonment. This is again, another example of thought where a person, maybe he will, you know, cook up a story and uh, try to file a case against another person. So these are all examples of thoughts. So broadly, we can classify tort into three types. One is intentional tort. That is where the element of intent is there. Intent, that is intention. Intentional commission or omission amounting to a wrong. Intentional tort, where a person does it deliberately with a purpose, with a purpose in mind. Now, just for your knowledge, uh, I am not sure whether you have already studied criminal law, but in criminal law, we have the concept sorry, of- Sorry, sorry, thank you. Uh, you already know. I interrupt you? Okay, that's nice. So in criminal law, you have got the concept of mens rea. Mens rea means criminal intent. So that is different. That's the same. That, that is the same uh, matter, the question or the question of intention. So thoughts may be intentional. And if it is intentional, the intention will be tested in the court. But in criminal law, we have the concept of mens rea to check whether the person has the intention to commit a murder. For example, we say culpable home in, in criminal law, we say culpable homicide amounting to murder. That means intentionally, which is done, calculatively done with the help of accomplice or their abettors of crime. And or you know, um, culpable homicide not amounting to murder, where a person may uh, you know, the, the person may not die and there was no real intention to uh, really commit the murder, but, you know, the person has been wrong and there was every probability of the person dying or even if the person has died, but there was no intention. So this culpable homicide. 
So the quest, the intention is tested there. And in criminal law, we call it as mens rea. In thought, suppose um, a thought is committed with an intention, it's called as intentional thought. Negligence, again, commission of an act or omission to do something carelessly or without exercising due care and caution, which is expected to be exercised by a man of normal prudence in reasonable circumstances. So we have intentional thought, we have negligence, and the next one is strict liability, strict or absolute liability. Here we have a classic case of Rylands versus Fletcher. We'll, we'll go through it uh, during the next class. But what is strict or absolute liability that is applicable to cases where the cause of the injury, such as negligence, may not be proved? But what matters in such cases is that actual harm is inflicted or palpable harm that can be seen or palpable or actual harm is inflicted on a person that has caused the injury or loss to the aggrieved party. Okay, inflicted by the person, there has been palpable harm inflicted that has caused the injury or loss to the aggrieved party. So what matters in such a case is that an action has occurred. There is some act committed, okay, or even omission. Act or, act or omission, omission or commission. So what matters is the action has occurred and the resulted, and it has resulted in an eventual injury of another person. Now here the intention is not a matter of concern, nor negligence needs to be proved. It need it, it not be proved. It just, it just takes into consideration that there has been a harm and there has been an injury. So this is strict or absolute liability. There's two factors involved in strict or absolute liability. Harm is inflicted and the injury is, I mean, the injury is caused and there is a, there is a particular harm there. There has been an action and there is an injury. Now, what is the definition of the law of torts? So if they ask you a question, what is tort? You'll have to give me the entire thing, whatever we discussed till now. First, you have to say that tort is a civil wrong. It comes from the Latin term tortum. Tortum means crooked or twisted. And it basically means da da da, whatever we discussed so long. And then you come to the definitions as per, you know, uh, some authentic de definitions that we have given you, especially like Sir John Salmon. But let me just take a simple definition just for you to understand the Oxford Dictionary's layman definition which has been given the Oxford Dictionary's definition, a renowned dictionary of course. So tort as defined as a wrongful act or an infringement, that means violation. It is a wrongful act or an infringement, that means violation of a right other than under contract leading to legal liability. Now Sir John Salmon, we already studied in jurisprudence uh, during the introductory class. Uh, last Monday saying that he is a famous theorist. He is, um, you know, he was a great propounder of certain 